I wanted to just read 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 through 17, because this is what's going to happen this morning as we read the Word. It says this, it says, All Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that you could be, or the servant of God could be, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So I want to say it like this. You're gonna, the Word of God is coming forth this morning so that you and I are thoroughly equipped for everything that we face. But I want to go back to the very beginning of this. It says that all of Scripture is God-breathed. I just want us to just think and imagine this this morning as we behold the Word of God, that the very breath of God is breathing life into you, into your being, into your situation through His words today. The very, he's alive. When He speaks, He still accompanies that Word. And the very breath and life of God is coming forth today to equip you, to train you, to teach you, to give you the answer, to lift your head up, to help you for everything he's called you to do wow when we read the word when the word of God is spoken when the word of God is taught the very breath of God the very life of God is deposited into me glory to God I'm thankful for that I'm receiving that today that there would be a strength and a life and just a deposit of him glory to God Amen, amen, amen. So I just was, was just dwelling on that, mulling on that. So we're in this series on family and Pastor Nate. Glad to be here this morning. Actually, a lot of joy in my heart. Um, you know, uh, you can tell what's going on in the heart by the face, can't you? Um, there's just good stuff happening in, in my heart. And um, sometimes we look, and we're going to talk a lot of, to this morning about um, just warfare uh, and so many times how the enemy likes to get us to fight by what we see, right? Um, and so we're in the family a family series called Whole Families. I believe God wants families whole, complete, nothing missing, nothing lacking. It's interesting how uh, even this, I, I thought about going this way this morning or maybe in the weeks to come, but just how Jesus, when he would approach uh, to the people, after he finished his work, he came in, he would be like, peace be unto you. He, when he got into the room, like he's like, peace be unto you. Like he was declaring to them wholeness. How about when we just walk into our home? And, and they do this still in, 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 in Israel or the Jewish people. They say shalom, peace. That's their greeting. It's like, hey, what's up? Que pasa, right? Okay, that would be uh, Spanish for what's up, right? Um, or what's up for English. That's English for what's up. <laughs> <laughs> or shalom, they're like shalom, they, they greet one another, like, and they declare to one another wholeness. Like, isn't that cool to think that you could walk into your home, and instead of talking all that you're missing, lacking, broken, instead of we just say, peace in this home. Yeah. Like, that, that's a cool thought. But that's, what, that's what the enemy would love to rob from you and me, is our peace. And he likes to rob the peace that we hold in our heart by working on the exterior. Right when he were, when when the storms and the waves of life are, are going on, so many times it's easy for us to fixate on those things and make moves based on what we see, think, or feel, instead of based upon the conviction or a truth that we hold in our heart. And and the thing is, when we read the word here, we're going to get into it. It's so cool. It doesn't say the word of God is useful to only correct those that are. It's for everyone. It's not like anyone here just always gets it right. Is that right? It, could, could you and I miss it regularly, even with the motive and an intention to get it right? Could you and I say some things that we shouldn't say when we weren't trying to say, but yet we somehow said, and we, there we are, here we are, what do you do? How do you get back? Like, you know, you know what I'm saying? So like, when you look at this, we're going to look this morning, and we're going to talk. Uh, uh, it's, it, it was interesting how last week, how many of you enjoyed Pastor Evan, forgiveness, talking about forgiveness Man, I love uh, just having that mom, Mother's Day mom, mom's in the house and just a mom. I mean, to me, she's not my mom, but she's kind of, I love that she is a mom to our house because uh, she addresses some things, even in our family, that sometimes the dads just let slide. You know, like how many of you ever had a dad that just like, they'll just fight it out. Anybody ever heard that? Just fight it out. But you know what's interesting? Just fighting it out, sometimes it leaves things still uh, uh, let me say this, covered up, right? 
and just fighting it out. But moms, uh, a lot of times they are like, no, nope, no, nope. okay, come on, come on, we're going to talk about this. <laughs> All right, praise the Lord. All right, so we're talking, uh, so we talked uh, two weeks ago on the thief in the home, and we talked about the thief of comparison, where there's just a lot of different things in this family series, and um, just some pra- really practical things. We talked on communication, just, but, but the, the thief of comparison in the home, how we lock the doors to our house, but sometimes this guy gets in, the, and, and we, don't, we don't even recognize it there, right? But then last week, she was t- uh, Pastor Evan was talking on, on forgiveness, and again, these are things that get into our house that we really don't recognize so often, that, that they're underlying issues, underlying issues. And if, if, um, if there was a fire in the home, every person here would be like, oh, put it out. Like everybody just jumps too. But sometimes there's smoke and sometimes there's, there, there's, there's something going on, but you can't put your finger on it. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Like you can't put it on, but it's definitely causing some stuff. Right, and so we're gonna we're gonna talk this morning not just about the thief of comparison or or, or forgiveness. We're gonna talk about guarding the home and really some uh, a little bit uh, along the lines of spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare. It, you and I cannot fight spiritual things naturally. I want to start this morning, uh, and the title of this morning's message is guarding the home. Guarding the home. Um, can I say it this way? If you have a home, you're responsible to guard the home. Not just mom, not just dad. How about sons and daughters? If you have a home, if you're in the home, you are responsible to guard the home. So somebody say, it's my responsibility. It's my responsibility. So he tells us about guarding and fighting, in a sense, and and the wrestle that we're wrestling against. And I want to just go to Ephesians chapter 6. Again, spiritual warfare, understanding that the attack of the home, the enemy would love to destroy what God created to bring life to you and into this earth, which is through the home relationships, right? Through like the exchange of husband and wife, sons and daughters, brothers and sisters, shoot, aunts and aunts, just like family, or even you could call the family of God. What we talked about whole family, it applies not just to our own homes. How many of you know things that are going on maybe in your sphere of people, they affect your home? So all of this is so interconnected. And so in Ephesians chapter 6, he says this, he says to be strong, Ephesians 6, 10, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. And he says to put on the full armor of God, okay? And if we were to look at that, we'd see that it really all stems from things you, you pick up or, or are equipped by the word. We, the word of God is the equipment, whether it's the righteousness, like we just read that in, in 2 Timothy. But the word of God is the equipment. He says, so put on the full armor of God so that you can take a stand against the devil's schemes. He's scheming. Whether you sleep tonight or, or not, he's scheming. He's scheming to take advantage of you and to take advantage of me. And, and he says this, um, so put on that, for our struggle, so why does he have to declare to us and clarify to us uh, that our struggle, what we're wrestling against, is not natural things or flesh and blood, but against principles. In other words, you, we're, so many times we look and, and, and there's a commotion and so we try to address the commotion, but there's a, something underneath of the commotion. There's a book, um, maybe you've read, heard it or, or read it, maybe uh, it's called The Art of War. Anybody ever heard of this book called The Art of War? Why don't you lift your hand? This is a, a book, okay. So this is, fifth, uh, uh, this is fifth century BC. This is older than some of the Bible uh, passages. Um, it's called The Art of War. It was written by a Chinese uh, military commander. Um, and it was just all about how to wage war, and uh, it's super popular book still. Uh, it's it's just it's accurate. It's um it, it's it's there's wisdom in it, like huge wisdom. Um, but one of the things that he says, and, and that is this, and I just it's just a super simple uh, line. I want to just read it so I don't mess it up a little bit. But it's this: all warfare is based on deception. All warfare is based on deception. If you and I are going to go to war, we're not going to be like, hey, I'm putting my battleship. Anybody ever play battleship? B5. Boop. Miss. B12. Boop. You sunk my battleship. Right? Like, do you have that? How how many of you are like, God, if I could just see a little bit over the other side, you know? All warfare is based on deception. You, anybody ever play battleship? Raise your hand. How many of you, okay, so everybody here pretty much just played Battleship, but how many of you only took the book 
and flip the pages. Or how many of you ever played the electronic battleship? Raise your hand. Okay, only a few. And on the electronic battleship, you had to go to the book of codes and plug in and pick your form of whichever one you wanted so that the computer knew that your side had this certain layout so that when they typed in on the other side, the thing, it would go, boo, miss, or it would go, okay? We had an electronic battleship growing up, and I hated, I didn't want to play with that because when, and this is, I felt like I had an advantage or they would have an advantage because there was only so many options, so you kind of would look and you go, okay, I wonder if, so I'm trying to like uh, make a real quick note memory if I hit one in this area real quick. And I don't know, my brain just like retains things pretty quick. I don't like to read it because then it takes work. But if I do the work, I got it kind of thought. So I'm like, so I would think that other people are going to do that to me or whatever. So I don't want to give them an advantage. And I just want to pick up my own, my own formula and I want to put them all over in this corner. I want to, you know, like I want to do something different. I don't want you to have an advantage. And, and an advantage in warfare is, is always brought about when you and I get the enemy to think something so that they make a move. And you see this in World War II with the Japanese uh, over, uh, you know, in, in the military ships. And we thought they would be here and they're not there. And all of a sudden they're over here. They were caught off guard or they, they, there was a, a ploy or a move and you made yourself look strong over here. So they brought all their forces over here and really you came in the back door. I mean, we see this, these kind of things happen. All warfare is based on deception. Well, we have uh, Satan who is a deceiver. And one of the most important things in war is to know your enemy, but also to know yourself. This is one of the things that we, in, in our homes, maybe we don't, we just, we wrestle uh, so many times we, uh, against one another or even against the enemy, but we don't really know ourselves. And, and one of the things, even in that book, he, um, he talks about, like, if you know yourself and you know your enemy, the, you're not concerned about the conflict because you know who you are and you know who they are, and so you know what to expect in that war. If you know your enemy and you know their weaknesses, but you don't know who you are, you not, you, there's uncertainty. If you know who you are but you don't, and you know you're strong, but you don't know them, there, there's more confidence because you at least know you. But a lot of times in the church, uh, we don't put enough emphasis on knowing our own weaknesses. You know you have weaknesses. As a matter of fact, it's so funny that uh, my son uh, Matthew, my oldest uh, son Matthew, is just, we started getting hurt recently, like a little bit, like hitting our toe or cutting our hand or something. And he goes, we're pretty fragile, he would say. We're fragile. We're pretty. In other words, it's amazing that we've made it through life whole, as fragile as we are, like a little bump hits, oh, you know, it's like we're fragile, you know, we're pretty fragile people. We, we have weaknesses is what we're trying to say. And so then it was just kind of this thing, you know, like if I bump him or maybe try to just, you know, hurt him a little bit and just like kind of fragile, you know, <laughs> just that's what dads do, right? We're fragile because because I got hurt and he started it. So I'm going to let him know we're fragile, right? Um, well, we have weaknesses. I have a weakness. You have a weakness. You know one of the number one weaknesses we have is our own desires. The Bible talks about how the enemy leads us away by our own desires. Like he will use our desires against us. It's kind of like leverage. If you ever wrestled before, you can use their body weight against them if you know the right moves. If you ever wrestled somebody or somebody knows jujitsu or whatever, they can do certain things and you're like, you can be stronger, you can be all these things. But when they know the move, they can take advantage of you. Okay? So he tells us this, that, that when we wrestle, we, we don't wrestle against just natural things. There's something behind what you see. So again, all, all, all warfare is, is based on, or all war, it, 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 underlying roots is deception. Okay? So again, that's not a scripture, but you see that this is how the enemy works. Okay? He doesn't, he is, and so it's important as we're talking about knowing our enemy, it would be good to maybe even just talk what Jesus called Satan or Lucifer, having been there from the beginning, having been with Lucifer when he was in heaven, who he is a liar, a murderer, he is the father of lies. 
Okay? How many of you know what a lie is? It's deception. So this is how the enemy works. He doesn't work just open-handed like, hey, pitchfork, horns, here I am in your house. It's, it's hidden. It's deception. And so um, it says this in 2 Corinthians 10, 3-5, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For our weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to pull down strongholds, Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts success against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. He says that we're going to wrestle. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against principalities and powers. And the how we wrestle, we don't wrestle naturally. We wrestle with some, with some uh, mighty weapons. But what we do with the weapons and how we wrestle, and in a sense, where we shoot our weapons. How many of you know it's like, we got to shoot at some, the stronghold. That's what we're, this is what we're doing. The, the enemy can only work from the stronghold. The stronghold, you could call it his house. His house. You know he can have a house inside your house? You know he can have a, a harbor inside your house? You know, a harbor, a, a safe place, a place that he can go and nobody else knows that he's there. Maybe sometimes we don't even know that he's there, but he's there. But the weapons of our warfare, the word of, is truly the word of God, the sword of the spirit, the word of God. It's a weapon that is, has the ability to penetrate the stronghold where the enemy has gotten in and set up shop. Now, the word devil is dia, devil, dia balos in, in the Greek, which is dia, meaning diameter to throw through, like from one side to the other, and ball, balos, or meaning to throw through. So in other words, the enemy is always seeking to penetrate all the way in and get into the inside of your my life so he can work from the inside. Yeah. Let, me, let me give you um, a little exercise. You're going to exercise with me because this is how easy the enemy also works. So here we go. We're together. Ready? One, two, three, four, five. I got you started. You just, I didn't, I, did, I stopped. I just got you started, and now you're doing it yourself. This is how the enemy, he did, then he just starts. And, and come on. You know, and all he does to do is do a little of this, and then you're like 12, 13. That, that's it. You, once he gets you started, once he gets the inside job, he just kind of, it's like the dominoes. He lets, he lets you and I work on ourselves because he's on the inside. He, he gets on the inside of you, uh, uh, penetrates on the inside, all right? So, he, and so what you and I, uh, again, guarding the home, we're talking about guarding the home, and guarding the home, again, uh, and every person here needs to guard the home. And guarding the home starts, again, because where, where we're warring against and where we're fighting, uh, uh, how we fight is, is not natural weapons, but we need to know what we have spiritual weapons, what we're to aim them at. We're to aim them at the stronghold or the place that the enemy gets in and works from. And you know where he oftentimes gets in and works from? Is, is the way that we think or the words that we hold from within our heart. So now look, look at this. So we're going to talk about how the word, the word of God, and we're going to look at our hearts this morning. If we're going to guard the home, guarding the home starts with guarding the heart. The atmosphere of the home, guess what, it's, it, it, it's determined uh, and starts ultimately by the thoughts that you and I think. You want your home filled with peace? Know that there's hope for tomorrow or that there's a plan. You know when you and I have plans or know that God has plans or that somebody has plans? It's amazing how that just brings hope and rest. Isn't that interesting how God's plan was Jesus and he is the commander of peace? The plan of God, the fullness and the completeness of the plan of God is the commander of peace. When you and I know that God has a plan, a finished plan, like he's the peace. Plans bring peace, don't they? Chaos when there's no plans, but God said God is not a God of disorder. He's a God of plans. Like plans bring peace. They bring peace to you and me. And and so, um, again, the atmosphere of our home starts with the thoughts that we think. What what, what do we think? What are we thinking uh, about today? What are we thinking about our parents? What are we thinking about our spouse? What are we thinking about our finances? What are we thinking about this? What are we thinking about this? What are we thinking? Are we thinking what the enemy thinks? Are we thinking what the Lord thinks? Nobody knows but you. What are you thinking about? Nothing. (laughs) How does that feel? 
Anybody, I mean, does, can you really think about nothing? I mean, I guess they, like, what do you think? No, you're always, you're thinking about something, something. You just said, we say nothing. A lot of times our nothing is because uh, we don't want to give off what maybe, what's really going on on the inside. So l- l- let's look here. Let's turn here. Um, let's go to Ephesians chapter 4, 26 through 27. Ephesians chapter 4, 26 through 27. So we know, and just as we're going there, remember, the enemy, there's actually really three things that the enemy could be categorized in, three different words. He's a liar, he's a murderer, and he's an accuser. He's a liar, murderer, and an accuser. But here we see this. He says, do not, or in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. Can you be angry? Who can you be angry with? Your dog? Sure. Stupid dog. Your cat, maybe. Chickens, all right. But what he's talking about here is not animals. What he's talking about is with people and ultimately with relationships. Can you be angry with God? Absolutely. Have you ever been angry with God where maybe you let the sun go down and disappointment and anger and frustration with the Lord and the enemy gets a foothold? of what you think, and he plant, paints a picture of what and who God is and how he's for you or not for you? Absolutely. And here's what happens. It says, it's in these places of anger or frustration. Let me say it this way, disappointment or not getting what you wanted. This is how the enemy works. He talks to you about you. He talks to you about them. He talks to you. Like somehow you're just you're the center of all of the stuff. This is how the enemy works. And so he, you get angry, and so in that place of anger or disappointment or frustration, the enemy has access. So let me say it this way. Anytime there's conflict, conflict, this is where the enemy can get entry. So where there's conflict, this is, this is why conflict, he wants entry. So is there conflict right now this is the enemy's trying to get into your homes, get into your marriage, get into in some way. And he says, now leave, get, do not give the devil a foothold. This is NIV. Or it would say this in the King James where you would see the foothold. Leave no place for the devil. Leave no place. That word is topos, which is where we get the word topo map or topographical map. Have you ever seen a topographical map where you could see the mountains and the hills, and you can see where the draws come together and where the, if it has the next layer on it where maybe streams would be and the ponds would be, you'd be like, oh, yeah, that's a great place for a pond. Oh, look, there's one right there. Or you might think if you're a hunter, you might think, man, there's a saddle here. This is going to be where a great place to set up. Or here's this ridge, and the wind is prevailing out of a certain direction. I, we're going to leave that place alone because that's where the deer bed and you're like, I don't understand all this. Okay, that's great. You haven't studied a topo map. But there are places, and in, on a topo map, there's a lot of different terrain. And uh, if you really look, uh, of even just this area, you'll, know, you'll notice that there's highs and lows and all these places. Um, and, and, and it's the same way of your heart. Your heart has got all kinds of places. you got a place, we got a place that's got this high spot that we access when we come to church, you know, hey, hey, how are you? you? You just go, you just put yourself in that place of your heart. How about the place of your heart, um, I don't know, when disappointment happens or you hear uh, your dad say to you, oh, this is, oh, this is my ugly son, Okay. You're just joking, right? You've heard, I, I, heard, I heard these things happen, okay? And, and, and it's, a, it's a joke. It's a, uh, oh, but, it, but it's like, what about that place of the heart? Anybody ever felt like your dad said something to you or your mom said something to you, just messing around, irresponsible? You'd lose your head blah, 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 if he wasn't attached. You know, I'll, something that said, and it, it causes you to revert to or kind of go. And so you move. In your heart, it's crazy how you and I can move. We move with our heart. 
when something happens, like there's, there's, there's places in our heart, and is there places in our heart that God can't touch? God, I give you all of my heart except for this spot. I'm holding on to this because of how they hurt me. Well, the same is true. The enemy would love to find a place, you know, off that back ledge where the draw and that comes together where he can just ease right over. You know, it's an unnoticed place. He can just ease over and go, bloop. He wants a thought path, a a process in your mind. Uh, He wants to gain access into your and my heart, into your and my homes, where you and I are thinking a certain way about one another or about him. And so this morning, we're going to just talk about two things uh, about our heart, because start guarding the home starts with guarding the ha- heart, uh, according to uh, Hebrew, or not Hebrews, but Proverbs chapter 4, he says, guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it flows the issues of life. This is, pro- again, Proverbs chapter 4, if you'll turn there real quick. My son, we're going to start in verse 20. My son, pay attention to what I say, turn your ear to my words, not to the enemy's words, not to... The, not to what, the way he thinks, but again, this is where we measure everything and how we attack strongholds is we, where, where the enemy's talking, we got to say, what does God say? You want to attack the stronghold in your life about your marriage, about your kids? Well, they're just going to hell in a handbasket. Oh, is that what God said? Where is that found? Well, that, because what I found is sometimes in, in my life, I judge my kids by, by what my intentions are and, I, and not where, I, where my history actually took me and where God has me today. Anybody here mess up when they were a kid? Yeah. And yet somehow you're here. Yeah. Well, guess what? Your kid, God, God is teaching my kids right now, even if they, because, because God, God's at work. I got word, the word of the Lord to me over uh, that's bigger than what I see. And if I'm in a war and I'm in a war spiritually and I'm going to be in the battle and be on God's side and not give the enemy the foothold where he can work from and I now yield to his words to light fires in my kid's heart over and over and talk about what they're not and talk about what they're not measuring up or my family extended family or my husband or my wife, you always blah, 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 you know, like whatever it might be. He's, he's in there. Like, I don't want to partner with the enemy. I don't want to partner where he can just get in there because I have a, I have a view and a, and a belief about someone. And so all it takes is them to leave the clothes on the floor for me to think they're just lazy, this husband, wife, to whatever, never do this, never blah, blah, blah. That, you, you just jumped because the enemy had a spot right here where he already attached a belief in you. See, the stronghold that you and I have is a belief that we hold. A stronghold that we hold, a belief that we hold that is not surrendered to God's word or doesn't, hold, doesn't come under what God says about that other person. It's something where, where we count suffered wrong. It's something, it's a, strong, a stronghold is something, a place that the enemy operates from. It's a safe place. It's his harbor where every time something goes on, he can just come right out and go, boop. And, and he just builds that. And it's not too long until that base becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. And then it takes that more place and more space in your heart. Now, he says what we're supposed to pay attention to is what the Lord says. Turn my ear to your words. Do not let them out of your sight. Keep them in your heart for their life to those who find them and health to one's whole body. Above all else, guard your heart. For, what, for everything you do flows from it. So key, and then he goes on to say this. Keep or guard your mouth. Uh, and keep it free from perversity or corrupt talk from your lips. So this morning, two things we're going to talk about guarding our heart is, and you'll see this in Mark chapter 4, he says this, that if you don't understand this parable, you won't understand anything. It's the parable of the sower, Mark chapter 4. Such a good passage. It's one of those ones in our Bibles that should be opened and read regularly. Because there are things, and so we're going to talk about two things, what gets in and what gets out. In our heart, how many of you know there can be things that get in that aren't good? Yeah. Yeah. But how many of you know, may, maybe this has happened to you if you've ever had a garden or little kids or, or you're growing something and your kids just want to help so bad. And so the plants are just young and tender and so we're going to weed. And they're like, look, mom, that's my tomato. Huh. 
I love you. <laughs> Tomato, I'm kind of upset with you, son. Or, you know, the, there are things that get in our garden, but there are also things that can be pulled out or, or choked out, forgotten. So our heart holds, our heart holds, it's a holder of things. Matter of fact, our heart is an incubator. It's an incubator. So if it's not holding the right things, it's not going to grow the right things. But if it's whatever it holds, it grows. It's amazing. It's amazing how the ground always grows. It always grows. Your heart is always, my heart is always growing something. It grows what it holds. So what's it holding? What's, the, what's it holding? What has a strong hold in there? We have, to, we have to look at So we're going to look at uh, these two things uh, that, that our heart sometimes holds. It's, what, again, what gets in or what gets out. And I would say this, love for things or, um, and, and love, love for one another. We're going to just talk about those things that get in our heart, uh, love for things uh, or love for one another. I was going to talk about sometimes we forget the faithfulness of God. How many of you know that's sometimes what gets pulled out? Can, can anybody ever have the faithfulness of God? Just somehow, it's just not there. I know I planted that there. Like, you've ever plant seeds, and again, I don't know, we're in garden season, so like you planted a whole row of beans, and, and you know, so legumes, a lot of times, they need an inoculant, okay? Which an inoculant simply is like a fungus that causes and, and, and aids in germination, right? So if you, you put it on there, it has the right... To grow, But if you don't have that and your seeds are old, you can plant a whole row of beans and you're like, where are the beans? Anybody have this experience? Okay, thank you, see? Okay, it's not because you're a bad gardener. It's because the conditions weren't right. You, and you're stinking annoyed that you waited all that time and it's not there. And you know you planted beans. You know you planted beans, but they're not there. You got robbed. The other thing it could be, if you've maybe you've seen this, if you've planted corn. I don't know why we're talking about gardening so much. Jesus talked about parables, so here we are. If you have crows, you ever plant corn and see the stinking crows in your garden? They'll dig. If if a crow sees you plant corn, they can take your whole row of corn out. They'll dig it up. They're smart. I don't know how they do it, but it's happened. The whole because something came and got the corn. Some came and got what you planted. So things can get taken out that you planted. Things can not grow that you planted. And one of the number one things in our lives, and we're going to look at this, the, the, the Lord says, beware or be watchful. Again, guard your home, guard your heart. If you're going to guard your home, you're going to have to guard your heart. If you're going to guard your marriage, you're going to have to guard your heart. If you're going to guard your marriage, you're going to have to guard your heart and not be thinking about somebody else's wife and think it's okay because if you're not acting on it, you're just thinking, dang, you know, blah, 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 blah. Don't feed what you don't want. Don't feed what you don't want. Oh, I want, you don't want what goes with, like my, my friend, this, I don't know, we're just in these stories this morning. Um, my, my friend in Oklahoma, uh, he had, he has cats and um, uh, just running around and he, just country, right? There's a mule, there's a pig, you never know what's going to be there, sheep or horses or whatever. It's just he, chickens and quail and just, it's, it's in, you never know. Well, one day, uh, he, he was, had the, feeding the cats, and this little pup, raccoon, just, or a little kit, rather, a raccoon. How many of you ever just seen just a baby raccoon? They're so cute. So he's like, oh, my gosh, there's a raccoon. So he's sitting on the front porch, and so he throws a little of the, the cat food, and the, the raccoon comes up. Well, like, not too long, there's, like, another one. <laughs> and then a few days, another one, until there's, like, 11 raccoons. And there's just raccoons, and then the moms start showing up, like a, or the, and uh, and so he's got all these raccoons, and it's kind of cute, right? Um, until they got into his uh, chicken coop, where he was raising, I don't know, at that time I think he had about a hundred chicks, young, uh, and every one of them got killed. You know, he proceeded to help the raccoons understand: no longer will you eat chickens. But here's, here's the, the moral of the story. Don't, don't feed what you don't want. Oh, it's great. It's cute. It sounds good. It's so wonderful. He knows they eat his chickens. He knows they eat all of your corn. Come on. That's expensive. 
He knows. He doesn't like raccoons. But we like them just right there where we think we can contain them just right here in our lives where we can contain them in this little portion of our heart. We're okay just having them right here. Listen, it can't, they won't, it doesn't just stay there. Your thought about this, about, you know, uh, watching a movie and putting it in fantasizing, okay, this is way old, okay, but about Tom Cruise, ladies, okay, like, I know this is way long time ago, like, oh, he's so hot, okay, it won't be long until your husband is not, and you'll wonder why marriage is so tough, because, well, he's not this, so I'm not doing this. It, what you, you just say, just, just a little seed, yeah. just a little seed, it doesn't stay there. It spreads. Yeah. It spreads. So um, let, let's, let's look, uh, take, a, take a moment here. Um, again, conflict points, conflicts are often entry points. Let's just even talk with a, a conflict with your kids. You had conflict? If it's not resolved, guess who's going to set up? The enemy. Mom always does this. Dad always does this. They never do this. They don't like you. They think he's better. They think she's better. I wish I was never. You know what? Talk to your kids. Like even this, I don't know where this came from, but how about we love our kids like we chose them? How about we start loving our kids like we chose them? I've heard people say, I didn't choose you. So the heart is incubator, and it will bring forth. It will bring forth fruit. Deuteronomy chapter 6, 1 through 14 says this. These are the commands and the decrees that the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you're crossing the Jordan to possess. So observe this in the place that I bring you. And, and a place of promise, so that you and your children and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and his commandments that I give you, so that you may enjoy long life. How many of you know it's important not just to know what the Bible says, but to do what the Bible says? We can be deceived into be a doer of the word, not a hearer only, deceiving yourself. So we can be deceptive. The enemy's working because we're not doing. When you and I know and we don't do, Right? So he says, if you want to, here's what he goes on to say this. He says, um, uh, so that you and your children after them may fear the Lord as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you so that you may enjoy long life. Hear Israel or hear people of God. Be watchful. This is this word. Be careful. This is be watchful. So, hey, be on guard. You and I are to be on guard that we actually do the word, that we obey. So that it may go well with you, and that you may increase greatly in the land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord your God, your ancestors promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road. So he's talking about how to even just enjoy life and keep the right things in our heart. we got to talk about them. We, so, many, so much of our time is spent vegging and everything else. We need to talk about the word. To keep it in our own heart, not just our kid's heart. Okay, so he's talk about it when you get up. Talk about it when you, when, you, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands. Bind them on your foreheads. Write the word scripture on that wall. Get the picture. Put it before you. Keep it before you, his faithfulness. Have your autoplay worship songs on your TV. Set the atmosphere. Here's what he's saying. Set the atmosphere of your home. You know your presets in your car? Let it be uh, some word. Let it be some worship. Let it be some... Something other than just what pets this. Like, I, everyone loves, you know, a, a good country song or, or a good old feel-good song. That's great. Okay, but what about the presets? What are the presets in your home? What's the, what's the preset? What's the place that's auto-set that you and I are going to? Is it the word? 
Or is it other words? Because your heart will grow those. You know, discontent, you'll find that country songs breed discontentment predominantly. You can find some good ones. You know, you're going to miss this. You're going to want this back. You know, wish these days hadn't gone by so fast. <laughs> you know, tears, right? Are you going to kiss me or what? You know, with you and your wife, you know, like, come on, right? Are we going to, come on, right? It's a good song, right? But there's no song that can do for you what worship and honor and esteem for the Lord can do because he can honor you because of your honor for him. See, the position that he holds, it has so much to do with what our life looks like to where he's doing for us what we're not, and we're not having to do for ourselves. And what's happening now is thankfulness and, and, and we're not forgetting his faithfulness because we see him before us continually. So let's keep on going here. He says this. He says, um, so be careful that you keep those things before your kids. Write them down. Put them on door frames, your houses, your gates. Verse 10. When the Lord your God brings you into the land, he swore to your fathers to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob to give you. In other words, he's going to keep his word. A land with large flourishing cities you did not build. Houses you filled with all kinds of good things you did not provide. Well, uh, wells you did not dig. And vineyards and olive groves you did not plant. Then... When you eat them and set aside, be careful. And this is probably one of the number one things. Again, go on again. Be watchful. Be careful that you don't forget. This is the, probably the number one thing, the number one way that the enemy, he just uh, he lets time pass. Just time. And you just forget how God came through, just like the testimony we heard this morning about when there was a pay, a debt for your back. And you had no way to pay it. It was gonna. It was. It was stressing you out. You're like, Lord, I I need your assistance here. And he he said, call unto me, and I'll answer you. He give you a direction and favor. He made a way which is not fair. Favor, right? It's like I had to pay mine. Favor is not fair. The favor of God it surrounds me like a shield. Well, you remember how how it was with them. Is how it will be with me. The the, the spirit of uh, of pro- the testimony is the spirit of prophecy. It declares God was and He is. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So when I hear about His faithfulness, when I hear about His goodness. Yeah, This is why I got to keep it before me. I got to have things in my home that declare how he made a way when there was no way. I have testimony after testimony. I remember we, we, if we're ever in a place of tightness, I, I remember when we first got married and we got into business, I didn't know and understand the tax laws. And I, I made money and I spent the money and all of a sudden we had thousands, like like $27,000 due in taxes, and I hadn't paid any quarterlies. I was self-employed. And we're like two years married. I'm like 20 years old, 21 years old. What? And then it's like penalty, IRS, penalty, eat you, you know, yeah. chop you up. Yeah. <laughs> what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And, 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 and I, I remember having that news and going into Sherwin-Williams and, and going, thinking to myself, okay, uh, what am I going to do? And in there, standing right there, is this gentleman uh, that, that he, he said, hey, you paint? I'm like, yeah, I paint. And he get, I get this job, which ends up being over here in King's Crossing. It was a brand new house at the time in this big shop, and it was crazy. In that house right there, the Lord's like, I'll take, you didn't know this was coming, but I'll just order your steps. You can go in there at this time. I'm going to order your steps. You know, he could have, he was in there getting some paint. You know, I could have stopped by and got a frosty and missed my, but instead God was taking care of me the whole time by ordering my steps, getting me to that store and, 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 and coming to the counter. I could have been gathering some tape over here or getting some caulking or whatever because somebody was busy at the counter, but instead I walked up to the counter and here's this uh, man named Ed Johns and, and he, he builds big custom homes and, and he somehow, by the will of God, put his trust in a 20, 21-year-old young man to come do a million dollar house. It's God. It's God. Just God. Yeah. Amen. Paid all my taxes. Yeah. Thank you. One job. 
and for my food to eat where I didn't starve during those three weeks of doing that job. It's God. It's God. I got story after story after story after story. But you know what's crazy sometimes? In the moment of the chaos, I can stress and I can forget the moment. This is why it's so important to put things before us. So you don't forget. So I don't forget. We have to be careful or be watchful not to forget. Why are you stressed? Because you forgot. If you're stressed out right now, you probably have forgotten the Lord's faithfulness to you and the way he, how he made a way when there was no way. And here's the crazy part is, if we, we worry, it's so funny, if you can do something about it, you don't worry. Why worry about it? Yeah. If you can't do something about it, uh-huh. why worry? Yeah. Uh-huh. That's where you got to give it to the Lord. Who is, he said, cast your cares on me for I care for you. So care gets into our home. So again, because, because his faithfulness has gotten out and his goodness has left our heart. So one of the greatest enemies of the home is care. You got care? Money fights? Anybody got a money fight? Anybody had a money fight? You spent what? Well, if you didn't go get the snack every day, if you would eat, pack your lunch, if you would blah, blah, blah. Care. Care. Causes us to say some things, causes us to do some things. And why is the care there? Because we've forgotten how the Lord kept his word, how he brought us into a place of promise. We've forgotten we're filling ourselves with some presets that are not about his faithfulness. The presets in our life have nothing to do with all who he is. Because guess what? Life is good. We're not on the altar of sacrifice right now. So my prayers are just like, hey, what's up, yo? Like, Thanks for the grub, rub a dub dub. Like my prayer might be at dinner. That's it. Like I, there's not really this interaction because I'm cool. I got my dollars. I got my houses. Everything's good. The economy's good. I'm driving my bride. Got the wheels. Everything's cool. I, I forget. And then all of a sudden, unexpected, kind of like, I don't know, Pearl Harbor. Bam! All of a sudden, need. What the, we, what, 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 what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. All hell's breaking loose. Crazy going on. Now what are we going to do? Well, you're probably going to try to go it yourself. You're probably going to try to fix it yourself. You might turn to what it goes on to say here. You might turn to serve some other gods. You might look to something else to meet a need. Maybe it's a numbing agent to meet a need just to calm your nerves. Maybe it's, which somehow leads to, I don't know, drunkenness, addiction, doing things that you wouldn't normally do because it does change and alter your state. Oh, am I talking about drugs and alcohol this morning because, oh, they're so bad? No, it robs from you. It robs from me. It robs from him. Glory do his name. Idolatry, that's what it is. It's, it, it, this, it, when you and I put something else in God's place, it's saying that that can meet my need instead of God. Yeah. God doesn't want that for you. He doesn't want that for me. He's a jealous God. Let's keep going here. So, um, it, it, well, uh, the last part of that verse. So be careful not to forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt to the land of slavery. Fear the Lord your God. Serve him only and take oaths in his name. Do not follow other gods, the gods of the peoples around you. When we forget, this is when our lives begin to look just like the rest of the world. And then we're no longer the salt in the earth, the light in the, the we don't no longer carry the hope of the gospel. We, we don't have hope. We just have, well, whatever will be, that's what it, my, it determines my tomorrow, what I see. And we, we're, we're, we don't even realize that there's a war going on and the enemy is he's strategizing, constantly thinking about how he can steal from you, lie to you. In other words, get you to make a move that, out of your own will. And then he goes, well, you chose that. Or kill or destroy something, relationships, your family. He's working. We don't even realize it. 
But he says, he says, in that place when you forget, you could run off and you could serve some other gods. You could run off and you could begin to look like the people around you. Now, I want to, if you, if you ever look um, uh, up, like if you have a, maybe a study Bible. Again, the study Bible, somebody put some correlating verses in there. It's not the end all be all where this verse correlates to this verse. But there's word studies that would say that this verse, you know, it's talking along these lines too. One of the verses that somebody put next to there that is talking about the same thing is all, you go all the way over into Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 13, verses 4 through 6. That gets talking the same thing. Okay, so let's turn there this morning. Again, we're, we're going to get this piece right here. Where, what, what got out of our heart, we're talking about sometimes we forget the faithfulness of God. We forget, you know, how far he's brought us, how he brought us into these places, and something else happens. So he says this, and it's interesting God is talking to the children of Israel. These are his people. Covenant. What's marriage? Covenant. So marriage is a covenant. God is a covenant God. God, And here here now we're in this switched over to the same place where God's talking covenant. He's now talking marriage. And he says this. Hey, in a marriage, um, everything shouldn't come into the marriage bed. Like it should be kept pure. In other words, outside things don't come in, okay? Outside things, I mean, we hit on this a little bit just for a moment, but outside things don't belong into the marriage bed. There's the porn, uh, God forbid, but uh, crazy. Well, as long as we're, like, it doesn't belong there, okay? All these uh, just things, if you feel dirty in any way, or, or husbands and wives, you should be able to have honest conversation with your spouse. It makes me feel dirty when... That's the world in the bed. If you feel dirty in any way, you need to have that conversation with your spouse and say, hey, I don't like when. And guy, don't throw a tenter tantrum. Well, you're supposed to submit what? Do, do people talk about this in church? Well, we are. Because it talked about it right here. It should be honored by all. The marriage bed uh, like, should be honored by all. There's not twosies or whatever. And the marriage bed kept pure, holy, separate. So it's interesting that he's talking about this. And then he goes on to talk about even the next thing. It's talking about how so many times our hearts can get tied to something else. So, for God will judge the adulterer and all sexual immoral. Next verse. Keep your lives free from the love of money. To love, to love the Lord your God, Him only. Right? So, where she says, love the Lord, don't love money. Like, he, he's, this is the same thing. You're, you're breaking covenant. Like, I can't love Evan and love Mona. That would be adultery. Love the Lord, him only. Do not keep, he says, guard, keep it out. Well, does that mean, he, does that mean it could maybe get into our lives? Yeah. It, the same way that a pretty girl could walk by and you, you can notice the pretty girl. Is that true? I mean, you're not, you, you can see. But what you do with that next see matters. The second look, we tell the boys in, in, in middle school and high school, bounce, don't pounce. Talking at the water park, they're going to a water park during camp, like you'll see, whoa, hey, you saw it. It's the second look. It's the, the enemy, so here's the, keep your lives free from the love of money and, and be content with what you have because God has said, guess what? I'm not going anywhere. I've been good to you. I've been good to you. I'll be good to you. I've been good to you. He's been good to me. He'll be good to me. He's been good to me. Lord, you're ordering my steps. I don't have to leave what you say to... Anyway, thank you, Lord. So again, when I love, when I love money, it's because I, I believe that can provide for me where God can't. That's it. And why do I think that? Because I forgot that God provided for me where I couldn't. See, he got me out of Egypt. 
He put me in a home that I didn't build. He, he allowed me to drink from a well I didn't drink. And, and he expedited time. I love the passage there. He said, you can have a vineyard and you can have an olive tree. Olive trees are still alive. When Jesus was alive, those olive trees, some are still alive. They're a slow grow, baby. He said, I can redeem the time and I can, you thought, well, I don't know how I'm going to get back. I don't know what's going to happen there. But guess what? He said, you can eat and drink from the vineyard. You can harvest and get oil from things that you didn't plant. Years ago, I would have been faithful. That's God. God is faithful. A testimony I got for rocks. I got rocks the other day for free. Rocks. Y'all, that's for, for, for something I desired for my, ha- for my house and building. Saw them in a field. Those would be perfect. They were in a nuisance to this pe- these people. The whole time they'd been sitting there for, for, for at least four or five years, waiting on me. I didn't even know I was going to be building. I didn't even know I was going to drive down that road. I, and, and all of these, for me, for me, just picked up, piled up. I didn't have to go get poison ivy. I didn't have to go. I just got rocks in a field for me. God did it for me. Can, all the toil and all the hard work. Somebody else busted them up and got them out of the ground and just piled them up right there for, for Nate. Man, God loves me. Man, God loves me. Is that the testimony of your home? Man, God loves us. God loves us. He'll do anything for his sons. God loves me. I don't have to preserve me. I don't have to care for me. I just have to not forget my God. So and if I'm going to protect my home, I'm going to have to protect my heart. I'm going to have to keep and hold his faithfulness. But I'm also going to have to not let other things in. This is the second part. So keep don't let things, and, and I'm not, I can't take a lot of time on this because it would take, I'm not going to teach this fully today, time's sake. So we'll probably end up picking some of this up um, later on. But I want you to see this. Mark chapter 4, 18 through 19. We're not going to read the whole passage, just these two verses. And again, this is the parable of the sower. And others are the ones whom, this is out of the Amplified Bible. I'm reading this out of the Amplified. And others are the ones who, this is the, third, this is the third piece, okay? So in the parable of the sower, just a little history of it, or just you have these four different types of ground, right? You have the wayside. You have the very shallow earth. You have the ground that is good ground, but it has a lot of other weeds in it. And then you have the good ground, and that produces 30, 60, 100 fold. Only one of the grounds produces fruit. In the church, the predominant word or the predominant heart that you see is number three. Predominant. If you're faithfully in the house at church, you're, you're either preparing fruit or you are almost brought that forth. Have you ever been there where you almost brought it forth, but something else distracted you? Then you got to plan it again and take the test again. Anybody want to just pass the test? Guess what? When you pass that test, Next grade, there's more tests. <sighs> but you get to graduate, and you'll, you'll, you'll know how to pass that last test. All right? But he says, so this is the third, the third one. It says, Those, these are the ones whom the seed was sown among the thorns. These are the ones who have heard the word, but, so that it gets into their heart, but the worries and the cares of the world, the distractions of this age, its worldly pleasures, and it's deceitfulness, the false security or glamour and wealth or fame, and the passion and desires for other things creep in and choke out the word, and it becomes unfruitful. So here, here's what, here I wrote this, this little line. It, it's simple. So well, here's what happens. A new, stronger desire or a stronger word choked out God's word. This is what happens. This is what a thorn is. This is what, it's, a, it's something in there. Weeds are vigorous, aren't they? They grow faster. They grow stronger. And sometimes in our lives, a word can get in, and, and, and so and the enemy gets in. He, conditions are just right. There's a conflict, and there's a word 
that gets in, and it gets in, and now what happens is it grows pretty fast. It's, you know, like you heard the word of God, but what you're thinking about and what's constantly consuming your mind and maybe even your conversation at home is that word of what happened. So you're upstairs talking to your brothers about what, what happened with mom and dad downstairs when you got in trouble and you're like, can you believe they never trust me? Blah, 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 blah. Or you're talking to your sister about, well, this sister always got to do whatever they want and now I don't know why they have all these rules for me. Or they're talk, there's something happened and so there's just this seed growing. It's just growing, man. It's just growing. It's growing so fast. A word can get in that is stronger in your heart than the word of God and that's when it chokes out his, God's word. So we have to guard our hearts for words that are contrary to God's word and recognize the enemy would like to bring in words that are not only, um, again, his point of entry is soft and his conflict, but also one of his points of entry is lust. What is lust? It's not just sex. Lust is desire. What do you desire? Guess what? This is how Satan takes advantage of you. The thing that, got, that the enemy is going to come and get Trevor on might not be the, the thing he comes to get Nate on. Or JR. He's like, I got him right here. But Nate, he don't get him there. But he got Nate over here. And JR's like, what? It, it doesn't work the same way. James 3 tells us, like, we're drawn away by the desires of our own lust. So here's what happens is it's not just, it's not just that something gets in uh, because, because of a bad or a conflict or all this. Sometimes it's just an innocent desire to go to the lake. Who wants to go to the lake? Me. So guess what I kind of need? A boat. And then... If I get a boat, I probably need some place to stay. So guess what else I need? A, a lake house. Oh, I was going to say a camper. <laughs> oh, I like it. This is, the, yes, Lord, a lake house. Okay. And, and so we need a lake house and we need a boat. Okay. And, uh, you know, but we probably don't want to always go to the same lake. You know, so we might need a, also a, a camper. Right. But uh, I don't want to spend all that money on a big motorhome because I'm not going to use it all the time. But I'm going to need something also to pull the camper, right? Like three-quarter ton, you know, so that I can use it. But I, I, but I work five days a week because I when, actually kind of like six because I got to pay for this thing now. And so I only have this one other opportunity to use this thing. And so, well, and I'm kind of struggling to, you know, give honor to the Lord Ties and offerings because it's kind of tight because of some of these decisions. And but if I don't go to church, then I won't be conflicted. I can go to the lake and have my God time with God on the on the because God Jesus walked on water. <laughs> and so I just need to get a set of skis. <laughs> it, 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 I'm joking around, but there's truth in this, isn't there? This is not a, to be like, oh, what's your problem? This is. This is like our desires. I need a hunting lease. I need a this. I need a that. And it's not a bad thing. If it's, it's something that the Lord would often want to add to you in me. It just can't be, can't take his place. It can't become the greater seed in my heart. Because my children and my children's children depend on the words that my heart holds my home, I got to guard my home. You want to guard your home? You want to have a legacy? You want to have a family name that as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord? It starts with the words your and my heart holds. That's what it starts with. It starts with those words. What does my heart hold? Am I holding the right words? And those words, am I remembering God's faithfulness to me? If I remember that, the storms of life, they're going to come. But his faithfulness never ends. I was sitting, my, my brother Jake's in town this weekend. and Yeah, I know, right? 
And uh, so we got to hang out, and we were talking and just talking. And uh, we were landing in Courtney or in Hawaii, and we had sent this. They had sent us a picture of the sunrise. And um, I was just talking to him about me seeing those sunrises. And every morning there, I asked the question, actually. The way it started was, are you a sunrise person? I'd ask, Sheena, are you a sunrise person or are you a sunset person? Like, are you a sunrise or are you a sunset? And, and she said, oh, I'm sunset because sometimes, you know, like you don't always catch the sunrise because you're still asleep. You know, you don't catch all of that. But like those moments in the evening, you're just, everything's... And uh, I said, yeah, I, I totally get that. I'm like sunset, like all the way. But in Hawaii, I was a sunrise person because of the location that we had. We had a place that was facing to the east on a cliff overlooking the ocean in this big window. And so every morning, I was up at 4.40 because I didn't want to miss any of it. And there was some sun, sunrises that were just... And as I, as I sat there, we were there for 10 days. I watched every sunrise. I didn't want to miss one. There was a couple times the sunrises were, you know, normal. And the second day when that happened in my heart, where I was like, well, I got up at four <laughs> this morning, and that was kind of lackluster. <laughs> I got a grab in my heart. And the Lord said, you graded me. You graded my faithfulness. Because of what you saw? Because you didn't see the colors that you thought you... Did I make the sun rise this morning? I'll do it tomorrow too. Will you be there? Because I'll be there. Because I'll be there. Will you be there? Because I'll be there. I'll be there. Will you be? Because I'll be there. Guess what? I was there. And you know, when the sunrise wasn't, wow. I was like, that's awesome. And we went to a beach to watch the sunset. And we got there and we did all this extra time, didn't go to this certain place, didn't get the food because we were going to miss the sunset. We got out to the beach, we got our lawn chairs, and we got this only just to watch the sunset because it was supposed to be this sunset that was just amazing. And the sun went down and it was, but I had learned, I had learned that I'm not grading this one. Thank you, Lord. This was, this was good. And the sun was all the way down, and I thought it was over. And all of a sudden, what I thought was over, the sun had been down for 15 minutes. The sky came alive in a way that I hadn't seen before, where it just turned into a stinking rainbow on this beach. I'm like, what? I would have left. I would have, I would have grown weary. I would have... I, I would have bailed out and I would have missed. We would have picked up our chairs. We would have left. And God wanted to do it for me. Anyway, God's faithful. Don't forget. Let your heart hold faithfulness today. Let your heart remember he's faithful, no matter the conflict or the storms or whatever, whatever is going on. And then and be, be aware uh, this morning that if you don't want certain things, Stop calling them. Don't feed the kids. Don't feed those things. Don't let, them, don't let those des desires, don't feed those and let them become greater desires, right? Don't let him have place in, in, in our hearts. Don't let him, don't let him guard your heart. Guard your heart. Guard your heart. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Again, spiritual warfare. I'm gonna close with this. Guard your home. Part of guarding your home, it starts with guarding your heart. Guarding your heart, it's what produces what you and I see or it changes how we handle them. One of the things that can get into our heart is, again, it's a whisper of the word. And the, it, again, knowing your enemy, talking in warfare. He's a liar. He's a murderer. But he's also an accuser. The enemy is really close in the topos of your heart. He's in a compartment or a place 
It's right there. When accusations, belittling, or calling out in it is happening, whether it's for a spouse, a son, a brother, a coworker, a coach, the enemy has got a stronghold. When you and I begin to accuse, to belittle, again, this is how the enemy works. He's an accuser. He's going to accuse them to you. But you know one of the things he also accuses? He accuses you to you. And sometimes what happens in our home, it's again, it's like the counting of the numbers. It's not the enemy working anymore. It's that you and I continued the counting because of wherever or whatever we did to someone, what we didn't do or what we should have done, and we and we stay in that place because the enemy has got a stronghold in our hearts where he speaks from and he speaks from and he speaks from and he tells you, you're never gonna, you're always gonna be, you shouldn't have, now it is, too late, blah, 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 whatever it might be. You know how you address all these strongholds we're talking about today? All the forgetfulness, all of the, you, you remember and you put his word before you. You know how you address the strongholds? You just put the word of God on it. You know why? Because a stronghold is a place of darkness. And God's word is light. And light dispels darkness. And light, according to John, darkness cannot comprehend darkness. Or, excuse me, darkness cannot comprehend light. So when you put the word of God, in other words, what it says concerning that person, your financial situation, whatever it might be, the darkness has, it dispels it. It re eradicates it. It might have to try to move to another place, even like a stronghold, or you might have to go further. But get enough, you put it there, and that light will shine forth in your heart, and it, the enemy has no answer for it. So today, in your marriage, you want your marriage to last? No, I don't. Okay, you don't want your marriage to last. Who's talking? Well, hurt. Okay. Who's talking? Well, hurt. Okay. So who's talking if the fruit is hurt? Uh, let's go to Galatians chapter 5. What's the fruit of the Spirit of God? Okay, hurt is not one of those listed. Who's talking? That's you talking. Oh, who's talking? The devil is talking. So you really don't want that, do you? You really don't want the raccoons in your life. You really don't want that. What do you really want? Why? I want, I, I want it like it was. I want it like my heart held to. I want it like this. I want it like I wish it could be. I want it like... Like God might want it for you. Yeah, yeah, I want it like that. So why did you let go of that? I don't know. Well, can you, you want to plant that? We could plant that today. We could plant, we could plant that today in the incubator of your heart, and you could grow it. Your tomorrow, your tomorrow is based on a choice today. But your choice today is based upon the voice that you're listening to. So what voice? What word? What seed? What are you going to choose? Are you going to choose? Or are you going to remember God's faithfulness? Are you going to remember? Are you going to attack the stronghold of your mind and not let the enemy have an advantage over you? Let's end with that scripture by going to there again. 2 Corinthians. We do not want you to be ignorant. He says this. Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to pull down strongholds, to cast down arguments, and every high thing exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and to bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. This is what, how you and I wrestle against what we can't see. Because there's something behind what you see. You take the word of God and you apply it according to or to the voice that's prophesying to you death, destruction, lack, hurt. You get the promise of God and you put that in your home. And when you put that in your home, light hits that place of the, and, and eradicates that darkness and darkness doesn't have an answer for it. And if you'll do it, and if you'll stick to it, and if you'll allow the incubator of your heart to hold it until it brings forth fruit, you'll be so glad you did.
Let's stand. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I, uh, when I was getting ready for this this week, one of the number one things that I had heard in my heart uh, for today was, was not so much about the message, but it was about the, um, but what after the message, and that is the conversations for you with you and me to use the words of our mouth. Um, and what I heard in my heart was just this repentance for the places in, in, in that repentance was like, when you and I repent, we are changing our direction and we allow the hand, this is what I had seen, the hand of God to reach down into our hearts because I'm partnering with him and, and it just pull out. Like, like my wife, she'll be like, hey, Nate, can you come get this weed? Because it's like a big one. And, and so you come over there and you're like, wow, that is, but you come over there and because there's greater strength there, it gets eradicated. And so repentance, in, in the words of my mouth, is, in, is the sur- repentance, the surrender of my heart. Ultimately, that God, your will be done in this will. Your will be done. My will is saying, I want your will. And so God is now freed to do. That's what prayer does. That's what, you, why, why is prayer so important? Prayer gives God the authority to do for us because it's the release of our will. This is what, Lord, this is what I'm at. Like, my will is my, my desire. My, and he, it gives him permission to move. Well, God can do whatever he wants, really. Because it's God's will that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of him, and it's not happening. Because he's given you and I this free will. And that's why prayer is so, so vital. So just what I had seen in my heart, just this, this uh, places that there had been hurt, um, it, you don't want that because it leads to death places that there's been just things in our heart, we just can say, Lord, I've not been trusting you here with this, but I'm asking you for your word. And I just, I, I repent. In other words, I open my heart and I release that whole, I don't, no longer will hold to that. I ch- and, and, and he'll just reach in there and pull out and you allow him to put his word, his promise into your heart. So just right now, uh, we're just gonna, we're take a moment to just, to do that. I'm going to just uh, lead in that, but my words won't be your words. Okay? Don't let my words be your words. Let your words be what only your heart and you know with the Lord. Okay? Thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness today. We thank you that every time we come to, to be here with you, to gather with believers, to hear the word, your word. We are taught, we are equipped. Lord, you speak. Thank you for speaking to me today. For reminding me, for showing me, revealing to me where my trust has been. Where my faith has in a sense, died. Where I've forgotten your faithfulness and where I've been trusting the strength of my hand. Lord, I choose to remember today your faithfulness, how you brought me up, how you brought me out, how you never left. Though the world forsake you, I never will. I choose today to remember you. Lord, any place that there's been things that have gotten into my heart that don't belong, for, for maybe for a person, concerning a relationship, Lord, I'm asking you, fill my heart today for with your words about them. Any place I maybe feel, feel an enemy, I just, instead now, I choose to pray for them today, to bless them. Lord, we, I just bless them. I, I just bless, I bless them in the name of Jesus. Bless them. Let their family Be blessed and flourish. Bless their businesses. Bless their home as they go in, as they come out. Bless their health and their mind. Bless their relationship with you. 
Bless them. I trust you. Not my hand. I trust you. I trust you. I trust you. And I thank you that you're not just an author, but you are the finisher of our faith. So we thank you for a finish this morning. We thank you for uh, the end and the brightness to fill hearts, to fill our hearts today, to fill our eyes, and that we would see a bright future. Holy Spirit, have your way. Bring to our remembrance everything that you have said to us. Where we've forgotten, remind. Where we've forgotten, remind. We say, Lord, we're looking. Remind us today of your faithfulness, of your word to us. Show us the things to come. Show us your plans, and we come under them in Jesus' name. I thank you for families this morning, whole families in this house. I thank you it would be the testimony of uh, the people of this house, that their families are whole, their, their families are flourishing, uh, spirit, soul, and body. There's nothing missing, nothing broken, broken nothing lacking. In the name of Jesus, whole families, whole families. Thank you, Lord. We receive that in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Well, we're going to be uh, dismissed with that, but before we do, um, if you're here this morning and you've never met Jesus, and, uh, and you're here, you know, sometimes it's uh, you come to church because you're looking to rededicate your life or give your life to the Lord. A lot of times... We were on the streets when we find Christ. But maybe you're here this morning and you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life. Uh, right now, before we go, um, if that's you this morning, just that, that call goes out to you. Say, I want to get my life right with Jesus today. I want to give my life to the Lord. I want you to just lift your hand loud and proud, strong. Just right there where you're at. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Any hands? Any hands? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I don't see any hands. Um, so I'm going to leave us with this instead, right there. And uh, I'm closing with this testimony. I was, um, we're coming to the end of the, about ready to move into our house. And uh, sometimes we can be so busy about what we have going on in our life that we don't pause to talk about what really matters. And everywhere you go this week, you're going to have an agenda. You're going to have things to do. But everywhere you go this week, There are people that God's talking to and been talking to and sowing and planting and watering and been preparing a ground just like those rocks have been being prepared for years in advance. And you and I are going to be crossing paths. And if we're so busy about our agenda and we miss that opportunity or that holy nudge to listen and just simply ask them about their eternity, they're not promised tomorrow and neither are you. And so it's that simple. Just ask them about eternity. Ask them about where, if they, were to, if they were to die today, where they would spend eternity. I got to do that with the trim carpenter as I was writing a check out to him, to him and his helper, just two weeks ago. And I got to pray with both of them to receive Christ. Why was that so special to me? Because I could, I, in that moment, it would have been easier for me just to write the check and move on. But instead, I paused. And I was willing to face rejection. If Christ was rejected, you will be too. You have to be willing to face rejection if you're ever going to do this. When I stand up here on Sunday morning, it's easier oftentimes to just close in prayer than it is to give an altar call. Because when I stand up here, I'm risking rejection if there's not a hand raised. It's the same risk that I'm willing to take if you bring a loved one to receive Christ, to pray a prayer that I'm asking you to take as you go beyond these four walls this week to preach Jesus, the hope of the gospel to everyone, everywhere, on Monday, Tuesday, every day. Amen? Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great week.